Hey folks, my name is Saurabh Sharhati. I'm a program manager on the .NET team, and I want to talk to you folks about diagnostics and observability of .NET applications. And since I put the word observability in the title, let's sort of start by defining what observability is. Right? Increasingly, the systems we build are more and more complicated. We have multiple application tiers, databases, cloud services, you know, maybe you're even calling out to external APIs. With so many moving pieces involved, systems have to be designed, tested, and monitored. So like at every stage of the process, like design, testing, and monitoring to handle these unpredictable characteristics. And that's really what an observable system is. It's a system that's been designed to handle this chaos in mind. And I know not everyone will agree with the definition I'm presenting here, but I want to build consensus around the idea that observability is not just a monitoring concern. It's something that has to be enshrined into the design of your application. Right? And with that in mind, we'll be looking at two categories of observability telemetry today. The first are observ observability APIs that are part of like the .NET standard libraries. You can use these to instrument your applications. And while the runtime provides these APIs, uh, it's on you. The onus is on you to emit the right metrics and logs or whatever you need to track, like you know your service level objectives. Let's say, you know, if you have a business need where you need to track the number of burgers and fries sold every hour, it's incumbent on you to synthesize and emit this metric. So the first half of the talk will cover what these APIs look like and how you can use them in your application. The second cat category of observability telemetry are diagnostic artifacts that the runtime is capable of producing. So for example, we have this lightweight artifact called a GC dump. It's a graph of all objects on the heap, and you can use it to answer general questions like uh, object counts or you know, general statistics, paths to root. In this scenario, the you're not encumbered by producing the artifact, but rather you need to have a way of talking to the runtime to request this artifact. So this is more making sure your infrastructure is set up correctly so that you can actually talk to the runtime and get this artifact. Now, you're like, and if we if you make use of both these types of observability telemetry, your application will be more observable. Uh, the one thing I will add is, you know, this is a 30 minute talk, so I, I possibly can't cover every single API. There are other ways to get access to diagnostic information, but you know, if 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 you start out with these classes of observability telemetry, you're already in a great place. So let's look at that first category, right? The like traces, logs, and metrics. They're often referred to as the three pillars of observability. That doesn't mean they're a silver bullet for solving every problem you may have in production, but they you know, there's consensus in the industry that these will this these forms of data will help you at least triage and get closer to your problem, right? So let's look at them and sort of like uh, understand the differences. So you have distributed traces, which are really a representation of uh, how information flows through causal systems. That means if you have, let's say you have a multi-tiered application where you have service A, maybe calls out to service B, and then maybe service B fans out to like maybe 10 other services, aggregates that information, and then that you know flows back to the client. Seeing that like representation of, you know, A depends on B and B depends on the result of all its dependent services. Uh, that's that's the causal relationship that you want to see. So there are tools like Zipkin and Jaeger that you can use to visualize this information and help uh, diagnose what's going on. Uh, the other category is log. So log is is an immutable timestamped record of something that happened. Ordinarily, these are structured. Uh, this is structured data, so you can search for it. You know, maybe perform aggregations or some analysis on it. But you can have like binary structure logs. A and the third category is metrics. So metrics are a representation of numeric data. So there's 
you know, there's it's data measured over intervals of time. So something interesting here, maybe, maybe you want a histogram of response durations for like for all the requests in your application. So then you can compute things like, you know, P95 or P99 latency. And this is uh, interesting in that it's different from the other two uh, classes of observability tele telemetry that when done right, the volume of metrics you synthesize doesn't have to grow proportional to the traffic, right? So that does make it easy for you to at a glance observe what's going on in your application and you know perhaps use it to drill in and like triage into the other stuff. So later in this talk, when I will show you a couple of demos, I'll actually show you how I'm using like you know metrics to maybe identify there's something wrong in my app, then go look at uh, distributed traces and then you know maybe pull out a trace identifier from this from the distributed tracing viewer and then go search for logs associated with that. I'm going to show you how you can use all of these together to glean even more insights into what's happening in your application. Uh, and then so that covered the first category of observability telemetry that I spoke about, right? Stuff that uh, either you know your code or libraries had to do something to synthesize that data. Um, you know if you're if you're doing simple things like you know using ASP.NET HTTP client, those libraries are probably already instrumented and emit the information that you need. But you know like if you have any business logic or information uh, data, you have to synthesize that data yourself. Uh, for the second class of observability telemetry, I'm calling these deep diagnostic artifacts in .NET. So .NET, you know, has traditionally had like very strong tools for analysis of this data, and I'll cover some of the, you know, common types of artifacts that I would put under this category. So the first one's a, just a memory dump. It's the contents of virtual memory of a process written to a file. Then you can use tools like either Visual Studio or WinDBG and SOS to analyze that. And, you know, uh, based on uh, based on options specified at the time of collection, this could be all the virtual memory pages. It could be trimmed. It could be, you know, just the heap. So there, there are ways to, you know, alter the nature of data collected. The Another one I want to uh, introduce you folks to was GC dumps. I sort of mentioned this earlier that it's a graph of all objects on the heap. And this doesn't require you to create, like collect a, like a super large artifact like a memory dump. And it, you know, it could be useful for doing things like memory leak investigations. You can just look at like object counts at time period, at the first time period, and then collect another GC dump at the second time period, look at deltas and you know, number of objects allocated. And you can do th use that to find things like memory leaks. Uh, the third one I'm calling out here is profiles. Uh, and this is in, in .NET. This traditionally involves data that's emit, like that you collected on Windows via ETW or event source providers. So these are these tend to be higher verbosity events. So they also have a higher observability overhead. Like if you turn this on, you're gonna you're gonna see more of a impact on your application. Uh, some some of the types of data you can think of here are. Like sample CPU stacks, you can use it to diagnose, uh, you know, look at call stacks to see why application is taking so long. Maybe you can look at, you know, GC allocation events, find reasons why GCs were induced, or look at the call stacks that led to induced GCs. So these are, uh, these are usually again larger artifacts uh, that you would collect when you think something is wrong, right? And to to ascertain that something is wrong. And, and that you need one of these uh, deep diagnostic artifacts, or probably the, the things that give you clues would be your logs, metrics, and distributed traces. Uh, so I want to take a small detour here and actually introduce open telemetry. It's something that you're going to see uh, as we you know, talk about uh, traces, metrics, and logs. You're going to see this term come up a few times. So in terms of the governance, Open telemetry is an open source vendor neutral project as part of the CNCF. So if I were to give you the 30 second sales pitch for this, it allows you to instrument and write your applications without being tied to a particular vendor. Let's say today you want to send your data to Azure Application Insights, but tomorrow 
you've decided to use another APM vendor. Using a vendor neutral library for instrumenting your applications means that in future, you don't have to rewrite code if you change what vendor you use, right? And the consensus that we're seeing is most APM vendors have have or are adopting open telemetry. So in future, switching between or even sending your data to multiple backends would be trivial. Uh, so open telemetry is a collection of tools, APIs, and SDKs that you can use to uh, instrument, generate, collect, and export this data. And one of the things that we will see on a recurring basis is open telemetry defines specifications for tracing metrics and logging. Uh, I'd say this can there this can be described as what the in-memory representation for this data is. And then open telemetry also defines specifications for how to transmit this data. So for example, there is the OTLP protocol that allows you to uh, egress all this data to various different backends, right? Um, so what we've done in .NET is we've looked at the open telemetry specifications and we've gone ahead and implemented APIs in the .NET standard library that implement this specification. Uh, though I, I will call out the one place that we may differ from the specification is in naming, because some of these APIs in .NET have, have been around before these uh, uh, specifications were ratified. So I'll give you an example where open telemetry uses the term span to represent like a, a unit of work in a distributed trace. In .NET, we use the term activity and it's part of the system diagnostics activity API. So there may be a few differences, but .NET generally faithfully implements the open telemetry specification. Uh, so actually let's, let's dive in and look at the different classes of telemetry. So as I mentioned in for distributed tracing, .NET contains an implementation of the open telemetry specification. So some popular libraries like ASP.NET Core, HTTP Client, even gRPC have already been in instrumented with system diagnostics activity, right? Uh, so if you are an app developer, all you have to do is uh, add the open telemetry SDK, add the instrumentation libraries that you need, which I will show you in a second with the demo, and you get all this rich data. Uh, if you're a library author, this means that you can participate in the open telemetry ecosystem without relying on the open telemetry APIs because all these APIs are present in the BCL, the .NET standard library, right? So you don't need any external dependencies to instrument your application. Uh, one other thing that the open telemetry project has been responsible for is in addition to the specification, how this data is represented in memory, they're also defining vendor neutral specifications on how to propagate this information. As an example, there is a when you are making outbound HTTP calls, there is a W3C standard. It's called the W3C trace context that tells you how to take this information, stuff it into HTTP headers so that a process running on the other side can then extract this information from the HTTP headers and continue to propagate the state. So let's actually take a look at how you would instrument your library for tracing using uh, the system diagnostic activity and related APIs in .NET. So you, you create an activity source and then you actually start an activity. So starting an activity is the, the open telemetry equivalent of creating a span, creating a, and starting a span. Then you can actually you know, uh, do, the, do your actual work, maybe add some tags, set some status information. And when this activity is disposed, uh, the SD, uh, if you have a configured listener, it will take this and send it to your backend. What I'm not going to show you here is the, uh, like you have an activity source, there's sort of a symmetric API for listening. It's called an activity listener. Uh, unless you're implementing a library like open telemetry, you probably don't expect to use it. So what you're more interested in is how can you use open telemetry to uh, egress this uh, distributed tracing information that you've just created. So you would use a tracer provider. Uh, 
you know, you can choose your sampling strategy and then you can add the source. This demo source was the same one we just saw in the previous code snippet. And then you can configure the various exporters and you know the rest of your code follows. Uh, so this is this has been there for a while. What we've added now in .NET 6 is we've added support for propagators. So one of the things that um, I, I didn't mention, but uh, sorry, I mentioned that you know there's also a specification on how to propagate this information. Uh, the W3C trace context specification that tells you what header names you should use and how the values are structured. You know, you may not want to use that, or as a library author, you may not want coupling between a cu the current version of how propagation works and your library. So what we've done is we've added support for propagators. So if you're, so what you can do is you can specify how to both encode this information if you are sending it and decode this information, you know, when you receive it. Uh, so. As, as an example, you might be wondering, why do I care about this? You know, in the default case, you may be using the W3C trace context propagator, so it works with all your various uh, so applications, right? You could be in a polyglot environment, and all of these would implement that. But maybe you want to defer to a service mesh to do your distributed uh, tracing. So you want to say, hey, all I want my .NET application to do is just transparently pass through pass that header through, and I'll rely on something like a Istio or Envoy to actually uh, send my trace information to a backend. So you can now trivially do that using the new pass-through propagator. Uh, so now let's switch over, go look at logging, and you know I will sort of emphasize again, we get to, we'll get to see how these signals or types of observability telemetry interact with each other. So we can see how logging can actually build on and make use of ambient information that we already have available when we're distributed tracing aware. So the, the Microsoft extension logging packages define the iLogger abstraction. So this is something that's used in ASP.NET Core, the worker service. I think it's also used in uh, Maui now. So it is an opinionated logging system that's DI aware. And because these, uh, abstractions have been relatively stable for a while, we have a rich ecosystem of logging syncs. So I've called out like console, event log, ETW, but you know, pretty much you can egress to any, any APM vendor that does support .NET. Uh, I, I do want to call out that there is another logging library in .NET, it's called event source, and it's what you can use to write directly to event pipe and ETW. And there are, you know, reasons you may want to do that, like I mentioned earlier, it's really good conduit for uh, like really verbose, like high volume data. And the the collection usually works differently as well. So, you know, if you have something going to, like you want opaque data to be stored in traces, it's probably a better candidate than iLogger, which is better suited for structured logging. So let's take a look at how structured logging works with iLogger, right? So, you create a logger, you can have this notion of scopes, which is basically attaching ambient context to every subsequent log that happens within the scope. Uh, then you know you have these various log calls. You can see I call logger.log information. So that allows me to specify category level. We also have uh, logging template strings with named uh, template parameters, right? So when this gets sent to my logging backend, I can actually do structured querying. I can say, hey, show me all the logs where I was processing only artichokes. Uh, if you want to make it even like you want stronger context for logging, you know, we recommend you emit event IDs with your logs that can be consumed. So this is how structured logging works. One of the, the downsides of this approach is every time this say one of these log statements gets executed, uh, let's say this log statement, right? Uh, the logging template string has to be parsed. You have to identify the positional parameters where the name hold are named hold are. So this this can be a little expensive. So what we did to be, uh, in iLogger is we added, you know, you can create these cache delegates so that you don't have to uh, parse that template string, identify the named parameters every single time. You can just create a delegate, and then next time you want to log, 
you can just, you know, so create the delegate once and you can just call this delegate rather than having to uh, specify the log message template every single time. And what we've done in .NET 6, which is one of the, oh, sorry, I looks like this was out of order, but let me show you. What we've done in .NET 6 is we've made this even easier to do. So we've added a source generator for generating these like high performance, uh, uh, like cacheable logging delegates, right? So rather than having to define a bunch of these delegates, if you want, you still want a declarative model for doing logging, you can now just define a logging class, define these partial log methods, and the source generator that we've added for logging will generate uh, these delegates for you. So you don't have to write that sort of verbose ugly code. Uh, and so one other thing I wanted to show you, and this is what I was talking about, how these signals interact with each other is, you know, if your application is distributed tracing aware, logging can make use of that. So we have this thing, which is now on by default for all ASP.NET Core applications, where the logs will be aware of what distributed trace context you're running in. So I have these activity tracking options that I can turn on. So now if I go ahead and log this, if I were logging in the context of say, an, you know, an HTTP request, I will also see the span ID, trace ID, and parent ID associated with these logs. That's something we can, you know, show you in a demo. Uh, all right, so that was logging. Let's look at the third pillar of uh, observability, which is metrics. So we have a new metrics API in .NET. It's the system runtime metrics API, and it implements the open telemetry metric specification. So this specification was uh, is just about to be ratified or may already have been, I, I forget the exact dates, but it's a much richer and more powerful API than the existing API we had for metrics and .NET. So uh, unlike the old event counters API, it supports both counters and histogram instruments. It adds support for metrics with dimensions. So, you know, you can do interesting aggregations, but uh, given that this specification is still being ratified and it like came in really late and really hot in .NET 6, uh, the ecosystem isn't quite there yet. Like uh, the support for exporters is, is still in the progress. Like, you know, I think there's a, a beta version of the Prometheus exporter for metrics available with OpenTelemetry, but this will take some time for it to mature. What we anticipate is in the .NET 7 timeframe, there'll be more libraries that both emit this, as well as there are exporters and backends that are capable of consuming this data. Uh, I promise I only have one meme in the stock, which is, you know, going forward, uh, you should be looking, if you're adding metrics uh, to your applications, you should be looking at using system runtime metrics, not event counters. Uh, and then, so this is how you go ahead and emit metrics. Uh, you know, so here I've shown you how metrics and activities can interact with each other, right? So we have this uh, do work and we use both uh, an activity to track, you know, like any causal relationships that happen as well as we're emitting a metric. So I've created this histogram and, you know, I measure both my start and stop time. I, from that, I compute my elapsed time and I'm able to emit a metric for the duration of my full work. Uh, so now that I've shown you these three pillars of observability, I sort of want to jump over and quickly talk about uh, the other class of metrics. Uh, sorry, the other class of observability telemetry, which is uh, like, you know, dumps, traces, GC dumps. What we've done is we recognize that these can be hard to collect. So we've introduced this tool in .NET 6 called .NET Monitor that makes it easier to collect artifacts from a uh, diagnostic process, sorry, diagnostic artifacts from a .NET process. So, you know, based on whether you're running locally in Kubernetes, uh, Azure App Service, this can be challenging, right? Like every environment is slightly different. There's sli like different permissions involved. So what we want to do is we want to unify how you can collect these artifacts. Uh, so there are two operating modes that .NET Monitor has. One of them is an HTTP API. So this allows you to like on demand connect to .NET Monitor and say, hey, can you ask the runtime to produce this for me? 
So that's for on-demand collection. The second is a trigger-based uh, collection. So this is, you know, you, you can use rules to configure what on what criteria you want diagnostic artifacts to be collected. And the .NET monitor process will constantly monitor your application and collect these, you know, as and when required. So we look at the, you know, HTTP API, like this is a diagram I have indicating how you would use this in Kubernetes. Uh, you would deploy the .NET monitor as a sidecar as part of your application pod. And then you can just, you know, as an operator, you can connect to the HTTP API exposed by .NET monitor and collect these uh, artifacts. So, you know, most of these API endpoints are self-explanatory. Like if you connect to the dump endpoint, you can get a memory dump. If you like the GC dump, you can get a GC dump. And, you know, there are options you can specify via like a post body to configure exactly what artifact you want. Let's also take a quick look at triggers. Uh, I realize I'm sort of running out of time, so I'll try and speed through this. Um, this is the second operating mode that I spoke about where you can uh, have .NET Monitor constantly monitor your process for collection of artifacts. So let's actually work through an co a concrete example of what I may want to do. You know, I and what it about threat pool starvation in my application. So I can say, hey, .NET Monitor, when you see a process with the name .NET, and if it has a thread pool queue length counter of greater than 50 for a sustained period of 30 seconds, right? And this is the heuristic I developed for my uh, application, then you can go ahead and collect a mini dump and you can store this mini dump in my configured Azure Blob Storage account. Also, since dumps are expensive and can be prohibitively large, I also want to make sure this doesn't run more than two times. All right. Uh, so, with that said, I'm going to quickly jump over and see if I can give you folks a demo where I have an application wired up that does all of that. So let's let's sort of blitz through this demo. So I have my application here. All right. You can see I make some requests. Uh, so let me show you first. Uh, so I, I've pulled up my metrics dashboard. Oops. Uh, you know, if we make some requests, we can see, you know, this is, so this is a live Grafana dashboard that is, uh, that is visualizing metrics as, uh, that my application is emitting. If I'm interested in not just the number of, you know, requests, maybe I want to dive in and see what exactly those requests are doing. I could perhaps dive into the distributed tracing aspect of it. So this application is also wired for distributed tracing. So if I jump into my Zipkin demo uh, and I just search, you can see a bunch of these requests that I show, made show up in here. If I jump in here, I can actually see all the causal re relationship between the request I made and you know subsequent operations happening in the process. So you can see when I made a API, like a call to the front end, it made subsequent HTTP calls. If I want more information about these, I can take this identifier, like I can take this trace ID, go jump into my logging backend, right? So let me throw this into my logging backend, and you can see this is the thing I mentioned you, right? Like logs are now enriched with ambient information on what's happening. So now I'm able to see all the logs that ran in the context of this distributed trace. So I can use you know, data from the various different observability signals and jump around them. Uh, and then the one last thing I wanted to show you is the always on monitoring. So the other thing I've done in this application is actually wired it up for always on monitoring. And I'll show you quickly how I've collected assembly load events. So I've using the criteria I mentioned, I've set up a trigger for startup that on process startup will collect a trace with this provider and this keyword. And if you're not familiar with this, this is the assembly load event uh, provider with keywords. So this is, you know, analogous to fusion log that you may be used to in uh, like .NET Framework. And if I go ahead and open this, so what's happened is in the time that we've been talking on our application been running at process start, I collected, uh, a, I collected a fusion log trace, if you will, and I can go ahead and now open this file. It actually generated a file into this artifact, which is a directory I had configured. And now I'm able to open this and view this in Visual Studio. Now I did it for a startup event, but you could probably do it for other triggers, like I mentioned. Um, and with that, one last thing. 
.NET Monitor is now available. We had a blog post that went out earlier today. It's also available as a .NET tool and a Docker image. Uh, I hope you try it out and you know let us know how it works for you and how it helps you solve you know difficult diagnostics problems. Uh, and with that, thank you folks for listening and joining. I know there's a lot of content we covered today, and I hope this was useful. All right. So, Rob, thank you so much for that really good session. .NET Monitor, i got to get that installed. I've got an app or two I want to measure and see what's going on under the covers. Thank you so much. We are out of time. We don't have time for questions. I do want to highlight one comment here from our friend Martin Woodward saying the crew's been killing it since before remote conferences are cool. Amazing the amount of valuable content this small but mighty team can create with a tiny budget, but a whole lot of knowledge and even more love for their community. Thank you so much, Martin. Our, our team is working hard here, and we've still got about 26 hours to go here. Coming up, we're going to be starting a 24-hour marathon live, going around the world. I hope you stick with us for that.